Hello and welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Capitol Hill correspondent Nancy Cordes. Thanks for joining us. The first time home buyer tax credit is scheduled to expire at the end of next month. It's been a very popular stimulus program similar to Cash for Clunkers in its popularity and it gave out eight up to eight thousand dollars uh, in tax credits to first time home buyers to try to rebuild and restart the housing market. Well, now some members of Congress are arguing that this credit should be extended and leading the charge is Senator Johnny Isaacson of Georgia, Republican from Georgia. Thank you so much for joining us. And you're arguing not only that this program should be extended, but that it should be expanded. Well, that's correct. In fact, I originally proposed it as a year long program over a year and a half ago. We're getting ready to go into the season where home sales die anyway, December, January, and February. We're going to put our economy in a very precarious position if this tax credit goes away. I think it should be extended to June 30th of next year. The income limitation should rise from $150,000 to $300,000 for a family filing jointly. And it ought to be available to any homeowner that buys and occupies as a residence for three years, not just a first-time home buyer. And why do you think those changes should be made? You know, history is a great teacher. I was in the real estate business in 1974. The market collapsed. Congress passed a $2,000 tax credit. Let it last for a year. It brought our economy back. It turned housing around and in turn took a recession and turned it back into prosperity. So we've got a record 34 years ago of what's right to do to really re-stimulate the market. The tax credit is the right thing to do. What were your criteria originally for determining whether this program worked the first time around and did it work as well as you had hoped? The eight, well, the $8,000 for the first time home buyer has worked well. The estimates are 350 to 400,000 home sales have taken place because of it. And quite frankly, that's the substantial number of home sales that were legitimate arm's length sales because most of the market today are foreclosures and short sales. The tax credits really helped to kind of stabilize home values and give us a chance to begin for the economy to return. Any estimate on how much it would cost to expand the program the way you want to do it, basically double the income limit to $300,000 for a family and also extend it not just to first time home buyers but to all home buyers? All home buyers who occupy as their principal residence. The CBO score we got yesterday is $16.7 billion if it's available through June of next year. How would you pay for that? Well, there are any number of ways. We're getting the dividends from the TARP money that was loaned to the banks that's coming in billions of dollars at a time. We have stimulus money that's sitting in the bank unspent and unstimulating right now, which could be used as an offset. So there are a number of offsets to use in existing funds in the system without having to create a new offset. Now, you can have all the tax credits in the world, but that won't help enough if banks don't start lending again, right? I mean, there are so many people out there who have great credit, have the money for a down payment, would love to take advantage of the tax credit, but still haven't been able to buy because banks just aren't lending. Well, that's therein lies the genius of this proposal. Banks aren't lending and they're not making loans because they're so constricted by the FDIC because of the real estate development loans they have that are non-performing. If you bring the housing market back and new homes start again, those loans that are now now performing in community banks become performing assets, which frees up liquidity for the bank to in turn make loans. So this is not only the key to help somebody buy a home, it, or the key just to stabilize values. It also helps to bring back lending for reasonable, highly qualified people. There hasn't been a lot of appetite for a second stimulus here on Capitol right. Hill, as you know, but is this a way of kind of doing a piecemeal second stimulus? You've got programs like this, you've got people advocating for extending unemployment benefits. Is this a kind of way of, of doing a, a piecemeal second stimulus without really calling it that? I don't think so because the majority of the Congress recognizes this is the one thing we've done that works. It's tangibly evident that it has produced housing sales, it has helped stabilize values, and it's helped in the marketplace. The $787 billion in stimulus, the $5.5 trillion in Federal Reserve uh, you know, deployments in the banking system and AIG, all those things did is they stopped bleeding. They didn't stimulate the economy. This is the one thing we already know is working. That's why we ought to extend it. Now, uh, I know uh, you are a former realtor, as you mentioned, and realtors love this program, home builders love this program, but what do you say to those economists who say this actually isn't much of a true stimulus because the lion's share of people who are taking advantage of this credit were just going to buy anyway? Well, that's precisely why you do it. They miss one thing. They're, yes, they're going to buy, but they were putting the purchase off. 
There was no stimulus to the marketplace. We're not trying to create a sale that wasn't going to exist. We're trying to move sales back to some sense of normalcy so the market can perform itself. So I respectfully disagree with those economists. One last question. I know you said that, uh, that well, we all know that this is set to expire right now unless it's renewed at the end of November. People are already uh, not able to take advantage of it because many of them uh, won't be able to close on Running their homes by the end of November. How soon do you think a, a vote will come on your amendment to expand? I it? think within the next week to 10 days. I think people in Congress, we've had a huge hearing this morning with Secretary Donovan. The administration recognizes the sense and the urgency. Home sales are stopping right now because they can't get them closed in time to take the credit. I think you'll see it in the next week to 10 days. Finally, for anyone who's ever been told you can't do it, you're going to want to check out CBS News' Byron Pitts and his new book, Step Out on Nothing. It chronicles his remarkable journey to overcome life's hardships, including dyslexia through faith and through the support of his family. Byron spoke earlier to our Bob Schieffer about the book. Take a listen. And we're here now with Byron Pitt. You know Byron from the CBS Evening News, the Morning News in 60 Minutes. Now he has a book out, Step Out of Nothing. And this is some biography. Byron, uh, welcome and congratulations on this. This, this is quite a story here. Uh, oh, just thank to, you very much. Man. Just to set it up, you basically tell the story of how you were functionally illiterate still yeah. at the age of 12. And you talk yeah. about what happened after that? So tell us, what happened after that, Byron? Well, I uh, didn't learn to read until I was 12. I studied until I was 20. Uh, and now I work for CBS News and I'm on 60 Minutes. So the book is about the journey from there to here and all the good people, starting with my mother, uh, Franciscan priest at my uh, Catholic high school in Baltimore, and all the good people in my life, coaches, teachers, who intervened, who saw a kid in need and, and gave of their time and of their souls to help me overcome my issues. You know, Bob, there are about, it's estimated that there are 30 million adults in our country who are functionally illiterate today. 30 million people. If it was a state, it would be the second largest state in the United States. Um, I know the pain and shame associated with that very well. I thought it was a story worth telling. We're in the business of telling stories, and uh, that's what motivated me to write the book. So how, what grade were you in in school, uh, Byron, and you still couldn't read? Uh, fifth grade, uh, for sure, the beginning of the sixth grade. Uh, apparently what happened was I was a picture reader uh, early years of elementary school. And then when math started becoming more complicated and I wasn't doing well in math, uh, they thought I was having an issue with math. I was tested and they discovered that the problem wasn't math. The problem was I couldn't read the directions. I've been faking it to that point, as many people do in our country who struggle with literacy. You find ways to make excuses. Uh, you get other people to do your work. And I've become pretty good at faking it. I was blessed with a good memory so I could memorize the things I had to do. Uh, I was a polite kid, a, a quiet kid. Uh, my mother was well known at the school. She was active in my education. And so it was known that if there was a problem, you call his mother and she'll deal with it. So I was one of those kids who just sort of drifted off to the side and, and I guess people didn't pay close enough attention with me until it was diagnosed when I was almost in middle school. The, uh, the subtitle of your book is How uh, Faith and Family help me conquer these challenges. Tell me a little bit about that. What part did faith play? What part did your family play? And how hard yeah. was it uh, getting to that point where you finally recognized and realized what was wrong? Sure. It was, uh, it, it was, it was a difficult time. I, I often say it was the hardest, hardest time of my life, hard any assignment I've been on uh, for CBS News. Uh, I talk about faith. My own family's uh, faith system. You know, we're, we're Christians. Uh, my mother, for most of my life, Bob, my mother, uh, she's worn a small mustard seed around her neck encased in a, in a small plastic ball. Uh, mindful of the scripture, if you have faith the size of a, of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. It was with that kind of faith. My mother, uh, who at that point, my parents were divorced, was a single parent. Despite what people told her early on that we can't help your son, we're not really sure. Uh, one therapist suggested that maybe he's mentally retarded and he should be institutionalized. Another said, well, wait until he's 15 and, and bring him back then. And my mother knew enough to say, well, wait a minute. If we wait till he's 15, he could be dead or in prison by the time. He needs help right now. So she never gave up on me. She never let the school give up on me. And certainly in those nights, I'm sure at home, um, I, I, most parents can relate to this. Your child is struggling with something. You reach out to all the places you know to reach out, and no one's providing you with help. I think in those moments, my mother relied greatly on her faith to sustain her, to keep her encouraged so she could encourage me. 
It is the faith by which she raised me that I, that I lean on now today. You know, I, I know you played college football, Byron. Uh, so at what point did you feel that you, you, know, you were able to read at least? Was it high school? When did you finally figure yeah, out what was going uh, on here? Probably, well, I, pr I was finally reading at grade level by my junior year in high school. In fact, it was spring of my junior year in high school before I ever got my first A ever in school. When I went to high school, I was uh, below grade level. Uh, I went to an all-boys Catholic high school, Archbishop Curley uh, High School in Baltimore. And out of a class of about 370 students or so, I was ranked 20 from the bottom my freshman year. Uh, but when I graduated, I graduated 30 from the top. Uh, still not a great student, but I had come a long way. Uh, from remedial reading, remedial math in the ninth and 10th grade, uh, teachers and counselors at St. Catherine's, the Franciscan priests there, they worked with me and told me that all things are possible if you put in the work, uh, if you're committed to it, and certainly I've put in the work. And, uh, and so by my junior year, I was at grade level. So the title is Step Out on Nothing. Uh, yeah. What exactly, where does that come from? Well, uh, the, the title, Step Out on Nothing, comes from a sermon at my church uh, here in New, uh, in New Jersey where I live, uh, raised Baptist, even though I went to Catholic school. And uh, a few years ago, a, a minister talked about how for people of faith, that we step out on our faith, that for non-believers, they may not understand, they think that you're stepping out on nothing. But for people of faith, of all faiths, uh, that when we step out on our faith, uh, that's, what, that, that's what helps to sustain us. And I know certainly in my, in my childhood and even in, into adulthood, in those difficult moments, I mean, we all have struggles in our lives. Um, many parents have struggles raising their children. In my case, in my family, I think it was my mother's faith, uh, our family's faith that sustained us, that helped us get past uh, that very difficult moment for her and for me. Uh, I always uh, uh, tell the story, Bob, that my mother's from North Carolina, strong Southern woman, church-going woman. The first time I ever saw my mother cry was when a, a therapist told her that, I'm sorry, Mrs. Spitz, your son is functionally illiterate. Now, as a little boy, I had no idea what functionally illiterate meant, but I know that phrase made my mother cry. So one of my big motivations for wanting to learn how to read at that point, because I've been faking it for so long, was I didn't want my mother to cry anymore. It was that simple. Uh, that I was motivated because I wanted to bring joy into this woman who I'm proud to say to this day I'm still a mama's boy uh, and so it meant a great deal to me that uh, she'll be proud of me and um, that led me to do all the work that was required to get from there to here. All right well thank you very much Byron a wonderful story the name of the book Step Out on Nothing Byron Pitts's biography and it's quite a story. Thank you. And thanks for watching Washington Unplugged. I'm Nancy Cordes. You can join us every weekday at 1230 at cbsnews.com. Catch you later.